Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Instem PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in the question in the box below and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. You'll be notified when these are available for you to review. Um, I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Uh, we have a couple of polls that we'd like to submit. If uh, if you could respond to those, that would be uh, very kind. The first one will be appearing uh, on your screens now. Thank you very much indeed. And um, the following one is now being submitted uh, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Those polls, uh, ladies and gentlemen, will be on your uh, poll uh, column uh, on the right-hand side of your screen should you wish to, to do that later. Um, I'd now like to hand over, if I may, to Phil Reason, CEO of Instant PLC. Good afternoon, Phil. Good afternoon, Mark, and good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. Um, I see from your polls that a good number of you uh, are familiar with InSTEM. Uh, a decent number of you are actually shareholders in InSTEM, so thank you very much for that. Um, we did do a webinar on Investor Meets Company in July, uh, and I'm conscious that uh, people have attended, so we're trying to have a speed here of presentation uh, that goes slow enough to familiarize people that don't know the InSTEM story uh, but fast enough that the people that have heard it before don't get too bored. So uh, before we get into the presentation, let's do some quick introductions. So my name is Phil Reason, uh, CEO of InSTEM. I've been involved with something called InSTEM since uh, 1982. Uh, I've been uh, the CEO of this particular business you're going to hear about today since the mid-90s. Um, as you will hear, a lot of our business uh, comes from North America. As a consequence, I moved to North America from our UK headquarters in 2003. So I'm speaking to you uh, from just outside Philadelphia. Uh, with that, I will hand over to Nigel to do a quick introduction. Thanks, Phil. So I'm Nigel Goldsmith, CFO. I've been uh, with InSTEM for nine years now. I joined a year after we IPO'd. Um, when the government allows me, I'm based in our UK headquarters in Staffordshire. Thank you. Mike. Thanks, Nigel. I'm Mike Harwood. Uh, I look after InSTEM's regulatory solutions, of which uh, SEND, which we're going to talk about today, is one. Uh, as you can hear, I'm also UK-based, and I've been with, the, with InSTEM since uh, 1999. Uh, Gordon. Thanks, Mike. Uh, well, I'm Gordon Baxter. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer in STEM. I've been with the company as a result of an acquisition um, for 10 years. Um, I'm based in Cambridge uh, and I'm focused on the in silico business the development and the um, management of that business. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so we are going to switch our cameras off. We will switch them back on uh, at the end of the presentation when we come to Q&A. Um, everybody that's perfect um, Phil thank you very much indeed so you just need to uh, bring on your um, microphone that's perfect at the top the green microphone icon at the top With and then turn the mic on. You're back with us, Phil. Yeah. Can you switch my camera off, Mark? Every time I try to switch my camera off, it takes me back to the welcome. Okay. Um, if you okay. wouldn't mind just clicking on the microphone, uh, on the camera icon at the top and then the second one down, turn cam off. And Thank you. You're still with us, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Over to you. Who would believe that I was the CEO of a software business? <laughs> I blame anyway. the technology provider. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to talk through the disclaimer slide. 
Uh, we are going to talk a little bit uh, in overview terms uh, about the whole business, uh, review financial for the whole of the business, but then we are going to do a little bit of a, a deeper dive into two particular areas, send exploitation that Mike will cover in Silico Solutions that Gordon will cover uh, before we come on to uh, overall business strategy outlook and summary. of the business. Um, so Instem is a leading provider of IT solutions and services to the life sciences market, uh, predominantly the research and development, but not exclusively the research and development um, phases of life sciences. Uh, and it's not difficult for uh, the Instem team to be motivated uh, when they come into work every day, because what we do is we enable our clients to bring their life enhancing products to market faster. You know, never is that truer than right now, uh, where we are not just helping uh, our clients, uh, many of whom are drug companies uh, with their wide portfolio of drugs, but we are also helping them with their COVID-19 uh, vaccines and therapies, uh, either with our software solutions uh, that people license and use in their, prem in their companies, or um, people outsourcing business to us where we use our technology uh, on their behalf. The business is organized into three market-facing areas, study management, regulatory solutions, and informatics. Uh, study management is a portfolio of solutions that help manage the workflow of uh, studies, experiments in a laboratory or in a clinic. Uh, these studies might be uh, being performed on uh, cell cultures, tissues, animals, human volunteers. Uh, and what we are doing is we are orchestrating those studies. We are telling the, uh, the researchers, the clinicians what they need to do minute by minute. Uh, we are collecting all of the data and then we are doing the statistical analysis and reporting at the end of those studies. And for the, st the studies that are successful, uh, the data will end up in the hands of the regulatory authorities uh, to give approval for a drug to be taken from uh, the preclinical phase, the animal testing phase into the human phase, or uh, from that later phase to allow marketing of the products. That's where regulatory solutions kicks in. So regulatory solutions takes the data from study management applications, either ours or competitors or other ways that clients have collected their study management data. And it transforms the data into the form uh, that is required by the US Food and Drug Administration. Mike will talk more about this later on. The other half of regulatory solutions is predominantly focused on helping uh, the clients when they have an approved regulated product, a drug, a medical device, to be able to make the submissions that allow that product to be marketed in each new country around the world where that product is launched. Uh, and that is an IT solution that manages the, the data and keeps that current. Uh, so those uh, products can remain on the market. The final area of the business, uh, informatics, we also call it in silico solutions. Uh, this is the area that Gordon runs, uh, as well as his responsibilities as the company's chief scientific officer, is all about looking at large volumes of historic data and deriving insights. It's a really exciting area of the business, uh, and that's why Gordon is going to do a deeper dive uh, a little later in the presentation. So our leading market position. Um, so this is uh, a huge benefit to us. We've been in business uh, for around 50 years. Uh, we have amassed um, a tremendous client base from whom we generate significant recurring revenue uh, in annual support and maintenance for software that we've sold in the past, 
or annually recurring software as a service subscriptions. Although we've amassed a great client base, there are still many clients to go after. Uh, so uh, the fact that we are very well you know, penetrated in the market is a good thing, uh, but it doesn't mean that there is a limit on our growth. We've invested very heavily over the last 10 years in the global platform that allows us to provide our products and services in all of the major parts of the world where research and development in life science is undertaken at volume. So North America, uh, Western Europe in particular, but not just Western Europe, the UK, um, increasingly uh, emerging markets like China and Korea um, and India, uh, as well as a, another long-term established market in Japan. Uh, that's quite an expensive endeavor to put that platform in place, particularly for a you know a relatively small business like Instem, uh, a business uh, that last year had just under £26 million pounds of revenue. But what it means is that we can provide uh, an excellent quality of support to our clients wherever they do their research and development. Our leading market position helps us when it comes to client retention. With 60% of our revenue recurring, it's really important that we don't have churn in those clients. Uh, and for a long time, we've had a key performance indicator around the retention rate for our recurring revenue and our established clients. Uh, and the target there is to retain uh, greater than 98% of the prior year's recurring revenue. And we have beaten that KPI uh, for the last five or six years. Uh, and we expect to continue to focus on that KPI into the future. It's not just about retaining the clients that we've got, of course, though it's also about winning new ones. Uh, and we have very strong win rates, uh, again, indicative of our leading market position. Uh, the win rates vary across our portfolio of solutions. Uh, at the low end, that might be 30 to 40% of everything we bid, we win. At the high end, it might be 80% plus of what we bid, we win. Um, and looking at the entire portfolio, uh, for the 18-month period up until the end of June this year, uh, we won 54% of everything we bid, a, a really strong win rate. Now, we didn't actually lose the other 46%. We lost about 14%. The balance are things that uh, just weren't placed um, and maybe won't be placed for um, several years into the future, or maybe not at all. Maybe people had some capital budget allocated. They thought they might buy something from Instem. In the end, they don't spend that money at all, or they spend that money on something totally different. Um, so we lose very little. Because we've been amassing clients, uh, today we have well over 500 customers. Uh, from the very large, so all of the top 25 pharmaceutical companies are clients, many of the top 100 pharmaceutical companies are, cli are clients. In several of our solution areas, particularly in study management and regulatory solutions, there's a very large proportion of our users that are actually in um, contract research organizations. So these are organizations that the pharma companies or other life sciences companies are outsourcing uh, their study uh, activity to. So as well as the end user clients, the pharma company, the chemical company, um, the CROs are an important part of our market. Uh, and we have uh, 18 of the top 20 non-clinical CROs, for example. Uh, so uh, good breadth in the people that are doing large volumes of studies. Um, but also we have a very large uh, client base in academia and not-for-profit research. Generally don't generate anywhere near as much revenue, uh, but this is where a lot of people get exposure for the first time to in-stem solutions. Maybe when they're doing their postgraduate degrees, their PhDs, they interact with our technology, they then go into industry 
Uh, and if where they go to work doesn't already have in STEM solutions, they can end up very influential in then acquiring those solutions uh, in the commercial setting. This slide talks to uh, what is currently in the pharmaceutical industry, specifically pharmaceutical um, research and development and uh, post marketing activities probably represents about 80% of our revenue and the other 20% comes from other areas of the life sciences. Um, the pharma industry is in a very healthy uh, place right now. The chart on the top right is the total number of drugs in the global R&D pipeline. Uh, these drugs are at different stages and the chart beneath uh, highlights some of those stages. Uh, the total number of drugs in the pipeline uh, is indicative, we have found, of InSTEM's fortunes. So when the total number of drugs is growing significantly year on year, there are more studies being undertaken, there are more submissions being made to the regulatory authorities, there are almost certainly more products being launched, all things that uh, we help with our products, software products and our outsource services. Particularly because about 80% of our business comes from the preclinical or non-clinical, we use those two terms interchangeably uh, within the industry. Um, the growth there is not just the very strong 10% growth that's in the global R&D pipeline, but actually in that preclinical phase, it grew 13% year on year. Um, and because this accounts for so much of our business, um, we have great demand uh, over the last um, 12 months or more for our products and for our services. We are also active in early phase clinical trials, so phase one through to phase 2A. Uh, things have been growing strongly there as well. So because part of this presentation is an update on progress during the first half of this year, uh, we released our uh, half year results in late September. Um, it's fair to say that things, despite uh, the challenges of COVID-19 uh, for many industries and for many businesses have been going well in the pharma industry. And as a consequence, things have been going well for, for InSTEM. Uh, there's a big focus at InSTEM in moving uh, clients from deploying our software on premise to uh, taking delivery software as a service. That's been a focus for us. Uh, those people who've listened to InSTEM's presentations before will know that's grown very strongly. I'm not going to talk to all of the, um, the highlights on here. You will hear, uh, if you are not familiar with the InSTEM story, that as well as organic growth, um, acquisitive growth is important to us. Uh, and we made our most recent acquisition in November of last year, uh, a company called Leadscope uh, that is integrated really strongly during the first half of this year and has performed ahead of plan, as we will hear shortly. Uh, and we have a very strong uh, pipeline of additional acquisition candidates to complement uh, a strong organic growth plan. With that, I am going to turn over to Nigel, uh, who will take you through some of our financial highlights. Thanks, Phil. So I'm conscious that many of you on the call will have uh, heard our first half uh, result presentation. And so I'm not going to go into too much detail now. I'd, I'd rather pass on to uh, my colleagues to give you the flavor of, of where we are operationally with the business at the moment. But uh, if anyone does want a deeper dive into these numbers, I will give you a, a little brief snapshot now. Um, but if you go to our investor center on our website, you will be able to uh, get the half year uh, report and, and much more detail on the numbers. So uh, as a snapshot, uh, these are the key indicators uh, for our first half. We are a December year end. So this is for the first six months to June of this year. Um, in all of the areas compared with the numbers uh, in first half of 2019, we were ahead. And in fact, it was our record first half of, uh, of any of the years that uh, we've been involved since IPO, which is uh, great news. Uh, revenues were up at 14 million by 
20% uh, year on year. Uh, as Phil mentioned, the acquisition of Leadscope uh, has made a great contribution in the first half. Um, that, of course, wasn't around at the first half of last year. So excluding that, our organic uh, revenue growth was 12%. Leadscope itself contributed uh, just around £900,000 of revenues to the first half of this year. Uh, when we acquired it, we anticipated a, an annual revenue of around about one and a half million in the first year. Um, most of that is subscription based, so one could arguably expect to see around about half, 750,000 in each of the halves of this year. They actually did 900,000, so uh, well ahead of, uh, of our expectations, so we're very, very pleased. And that contributed to uh, a very positive EBITDA number of 3 million, as you can see. Um, our cost base is primarily people, uh, so we have about 70% of our costs are our staff. We have over 320 people worldwide across all our operations. Um, the, what's happened is that we've been able to drive our EBITDA margins over 20% for the first time in a number of years, and that's uh, uh, been a, a, a short-term target of ours. Our so next target is now 25%. Um, where we've been investing whilst right across the business, we've been uh, probably more so in our Indian operation, and that's helped us to uh, have a reduced blend of costs uh, in terms of our, our cost base, which again has helped towards our EBITDA margins, and also our continued move to uh, software as a service has also contributed to that as well. Uh, the cash position was a record position at the end of June, £9 million, uh, so very encouraging, particularly in the current environment. Um, most of you will be aware that we raised uh, 15 million pounds net uh, post first half uh, of equity fundraising, and that's excludes, excluded from this number here. So we sit at uh, over uh, over 25 million pounds at the moment, and that obviously gives us firepower for our M&A activity. Okay, move on to a couple of pictures of revenues. So um, this one is revenue by geography. Uh, our recurring revenue is 60% of our total. I have a, a separate slide on, on our revenue split by type, but this is ge ge geographically, um, majority of which, as you can see on the right-hand side, is North America, uh, which has been the case um, for many years now, ever since we, we, we started the business on the basis that the majority of our customers and uh, opportunities are in North America, but we also have a nice spread of, uh, of, of revenues across the rest of the world, as you can see. Um, it is mentioned on one of the slides that we actually had a, um, a contract win of around about a million dollars in Korea uh, just at the end of the first half. Uh, only some of that revenue was taken into the first half and uh, the majority of that will fall into the second half of this year with annual support fees uh, going into 2021 and beyond. This is the slide that shows the recurring revenues at the bottom of the bars and the revenues by type generally. So recurring revenue is software as a service and our annual fees from our uh, license sales. So there's two bars, at the uh, two uh, elements at the bottom of the bars, uh, as you can see, significant amount that underpins the rest of the business. And the growth areas are in our outsourced services and our SaaS revenues, and they're split out on the right-hand side just as to give you an idea of how those have grown significantly in the last few years. My final slide on the, my financials is, uh, this is an annual set of numbers, so it just gives you our financial history. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, pictorially, and on the right-hand side, the absolute numbers. Um, so as you can see, again, we've grown steadily over the few, last few years. In the earlier years, on the left-hand side of those bars, um, that's when we had more weighting towards license income, which is somewhat unpredictable. And therefore, we had some years where we, we had some really good years for licenses and others not so good. In more recent years, we've, the fact that we are moving more to uh, recurring revenues, more predictability of revenues and profitability in cash, and uh, growth in our outsourced services business has given us over the last three years uh, a nice smooth growth uh, in an upwards trajectory. Okay, I'll move on to Phil. Oh, turn my... Oh, it is on. Um, thank you very much, Nigel. Um, just one slide before I hand over to 
uh, to Mike, uh, to just take those three areas of the business that I introduced early on, study management, informatics and regulatory solutions, and to uh, give some insight into the scale of those businesses. Uh, so study management, uh, you can see there uh, a little, and this is half on half, uh, half 119 to half 120. Uh, study management, um, a little over £7 million. This is the most uh, mature area of the business. We have solutions here that are the second or third generation of technology approaches in the study management area with our clients. Uh, so this is what generates a significant proportion of our ongoing recurring revenue. It's not the area that is likely to deliver um, high levels of organic growth. And what we have guided to here is to expect uh, mid single digit revenue growth year on year, pretty much indefinitely into the future. Um, now, you can see that in the first half of this year, revenue didn't increase 5%. It actually went down a little bit. Um, and we're going to go through all of the reasons. Some of this was a little bit COVID 19 impacted in the first half of this year. Um, it was also that large contract that Nigel mentioned. Uh, with Biotox Tech in Korea. Uh, that contract was delayed a little bit. It was meant to be placed in March because of COVID-19. It was placed at the end of May. As a consequence, we only recognized a very small amount of the perpetual license revenue in the first half. Uh, if that had been placed as expected, uh, that in itself probably would have delivered the 5% growth uh, period on period. Uh, the great thing is that License revenue has now been recognized in quarter three uh, and will be part of our full year performance. Um, we also had particularly strong um, software as a service new business. It is very common, probably about 80% of the times when we quote people for our software products, we will quote them both a software as a service option and that will typically come with a subscription and the revenue will be recognized monthly as well as providing the option for perpetual licenses that they buy and that the revenue for that will be recognized on delivery um, our preference is steering people towards software as a service uh, but we do have clients uh, particularly our large portfolio of existing clients who have deployed our systems on their premises, they bought perpetual licenses, maybe they haven't bought everything out of our portfolio. And whilst they recognize that over time, they are going to be transitioned to software as a service, maybe they're not quite ready for that yet. And so they buy more products perpetual. Um, so why we offer both alternatives. Um, it's great news that more people went software as a service than we anticipated, um, although there's a small short term impact to revenue. The long term uh, quality of earnings obviously improves, as Nigel was talking about. So that's study management. Informatics, Gordon's going to come on and talk more about this area. As you can see, it's a real growth area. Combination here of our organic growth um, in an area called Knowledge Scan, which Gordon will talk to and the contribution from the lead scope acquisition uh, that we did in November that Nigel talked to. So really exciting area for both organic and acquisitive growth. Uh, and finally, regulatory solutions, and Mike will talk to this in his uh, area around send exploitation, which is one of the sort of exciting growth opportunities in regulatory solutions. Um, I mentioned that there's two areas in here. Uh, everything that is related to the submission to the FDA uh, of uh, study data in the standard send that um, Mike mentioned and we'll come on to talk more about, uh, as well as our regulatory information management business that is about launching your regulatory products around the world. That area of the business in uh, the first half of this year was pretty much flat compared to last year. Uh, it generates good recurring revenue. It performed just fine, uh, but wasn't uh, the 
generator of our growth. The growth in this area all came from SEND uh, that not, uh, Mike is going to come on and talk more about. Uh, so that's the span. If you want to know more about any of these areas, please put your questions in the question area uh, and we can talk more about this later on. With that, I'm going to talk, hand over to Mike to talk about SEND exploitation. Thank you very much, Phil. That was great. So yes, let me uh, I'm going to let me start off with a uh, a brief description of what send is, so that um, we can sort of get on the same uh, on the same playing field here. So that, let's just start off with the the sort of process that send supports. Uh, in the course of applying for to put a new drug on the market, every drug company um, needs to send in data about the safe, the efficacy, and the safety of that drug. Uh, and we're particularly interested in, in this talk on the safety aspects of it, the toxicology testing that's been done. Uh, so to sort of give you an idea, uh, I think Phil put a graph up before about the short of 18,000 candidate drugs in development all the way across that pipeline. That's a, a lot of drugs that are being developed at the moment. And if my memory serves me right, probably four and a half thousand, something like that, different businesses involved in developing those drugs. Um, but each year, um, in the course of um, the, the, the process of uh, submitting things to the FDA, approximately um, 8,000 studies worth of data is supplied. If you think of a study as being an experiment, um, every year at least 8,000 studies are submitted to the FDA as part of the justification for why they should either be able to begin human testing or why the drug ought to be able to go on to the market to be sold um, finally. So those, uh, those studies go to support that. And prior to SEND, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, well, a few years ago, that would all have been a massive amount of paper. Now, of course, it's PDFs, and this data submitted in PDFs. So these are reports with big tables of data on the end. And the FDA reviewers, who, who are quite independent-minded people, um, they, they would retype large chunks of that data so they could perform their own analyses. You can probably imagine, you know, pages and pages of data and they're typing it in and they're making mistakes and they're you know, doing the best under pressure. They, they have a time limit for this and they're trying to get the data entered and reviewed for themselves, but a very time consuming process. So they come with a suggestion, let's get a standard for this data. Uh, that standard is called SEND. It's created by a, an industry body called CDISC. And um, the standard, well, I started working with SEND in uh, 2003, and it finally got mandated in 2017. So things move slowly in this industry. But then once they start to move, and they've been, as you can see, going for three years now, they, they really get going. So the standard's been mandated for the most uh, frequently submitted study designs first, and that's up and running, and it's still expanding. So there are, there are more complex, um, less frequently used studies that the standard is being expanded to apply to. So when you think about the part of our business that is to do with making SEND, uh, then that is still growing to grow as more companies have to make more different types of studies into the future. But having said all of that, there's a sense in which this market has matured. You know, they've gone okay. We've got we we, can, we know we can submit send now for, as part of a as part of an application, an IND or an NDA for a new drug. What else can we do with it? We've invested all this money in getting to this point. Where do we go next? And then the final point on here is a uh, sounds a little bit arrogant, but um, I can tell you from conferences, people often come up to us on the booth and say. I've come to see you about SEND um, because so-and-so told me in STEM is SEND and you really need to talk to them about it. So we are the leaders in this space, both in terms of the software solutions we provide for it and also in terms of the services we deliver, the outsource services where people send us their data and we send them back that data reformatted into SEND. So we, we're leading in both of those areas. So that's a bit of background. I'm just going to diagram to sort of illustrate that for you. You know, this is, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. It's a, a real attrition profile, isn't it? Five to 10,000 compounds at the left hand end, gradually getting whittled down through a process of testing and 
we know a lot more about this for va vaccines than we probably ever wanted to at the moment. You know, all this testing that goes on to make sure the drug is safe and efficacious. But if you just, if I go back to the 8,000 studies that are submitted to the FDA every year, then what this picture tells us is there's a lot more studies than that being run every year and a lot more potentially send uh, data sets to be created because um, sometimes they're being created and just not submitted because the compound dies before it gets to the next stage. But I hope that gives you a sort of a sense of um, how SEND is uh, contributing to this process of uh, developing new drugs. So why SEND exploitation? Well, as I, as I mentioned before, you know, this is a standard and for the first time, uh, the customers have got all of their toxicology data in a standard whereby they can suddenly start to look across from one study to the next. Um, previously, stuff was locked away in silos, not very easy to do those comparisons without doing what the FDA was doing and typing stuff in and reformatting it and a lot of manual work. Now, I'm sure I, I can feel eyes rolling a little bit at the words artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, but I can tell you that they're not put in here lightly. Uh, those of you who watch the pharma industry carefully will know that many of the big pharma companies are betting big on AI and ML. They're forming a real, a real and a highly invested part of their R&D processes these days. And in fact, there are whole, whole pharma businesses which are just AI businesses pretty much doing loads and loads of data mining and modeling. And obviously with a standard with all this data in it, um, suddenly it becomes a lot more accessible for these kinds of tools which all means that these companies can get the drugs to market quicker. Potentially, they can spot safety issues earlier and kill them off earlier so they don't waste time and money on them. A lot of commercial benefits to the customers. And for us, um, it builds on our long-term knowledge and experience in this marketplace, not just in SEND, but in also um, the, the non-clinical data collection systems that we, we've had for many years. And this also builds on our knowledge of the data. You know, this is not just big data in that sense of, I know, trillions of telephone records or something. This is also, it's not big in that sense. It is quite big. There's quite a lot of data here, but it's complex data. It's got really tricky interrelationships between it. And you do need specialized tools and skills to be able to both analyze it and to, to render it correctly and in a way that, that properly makes sense of it. So just a couple of examples then of what Send Exploitation might mean. Uh, we, we already sell a product called Send Explorer, which is, um, I think, the leading Send visualization tool on the market. Um, and like any analytics type tool, it benefits from high volumes of data. The more data you can put into it, the more the scientists can, can look at it and form opinions about maybe trends and, and patterns in the data. So how do you get enough data in there? Well, obviously, um, one thing to do is to go and mine all of your old studies and to bring that data out. And again, those, those data are in PDFs and you need to be quite specialized to extract the data from the PDFs, to understand what's going on in the data, to be able to relate it properly and to turn it into send. Uh, and obviously we have a team that's really skilled at that. Uh, and these projects, which can involve um, conversions of hundreds of studies can be very, very lucrative. Uh, half a million pounds wouldn't be um, at the top end of that at all, depending on how the volume that people want to uh, convert. And once they've done that, they've got customers have got a way then, obviously, of leveraging the data both for use with these visualization tools, and also quite importantly these days as part of their corporate memory. And um, so much transition in the pharma industry in the last 10 to 15 years, many people have gone. And often you hear them going, oh, we've seen this before. Where did that particular thing happen? What did we do about it? Um, and convert your data into a form where you can actually go and trawl through it and find things uh, really helps them with that sort of uh, exercise. And just finally, um, another, another area that's gaining a lot of interest is looking for correlations between in life data and histopathological findings, for example, so some blood samples, maybe looking at the results you got from those and looking for links between that and what the pathologist finally saw when he or she looked down the microscope. 
know, are, are there patterns there? Because imagine being able to do that and to see so, see a combination of findings in life and to be able to make a decision to either kill a study off or maybe change your dosing level or make, make some other changes to it that if you'd have to wait till the end might mean you have to run a completely new study with a whole different dosing regime or whatever. So real value in being able to do those kinds of things. And again, large volumes of standardized data really help with that. But again, can be labor intensive, can be error prone, particularly if you don't do this very often. There's a, there's a paper I've referenced there uh, for an EU um, project that was run and uh, they, they were, really had a tough time digging the data out of old studies in order to start to do some work on, on this kind of correlation project. Send data sets are brilliant for this, and uh, they're high quality, they're collected under regulations. And the good news from our point of view is it's not just that send data that's valuable. You want to be able to add some more information to it to get some real, um, real power in, into the um, the work you're going to do to look for those patterns. So there's a need to add more specialized data to it, which plays right into our hands. So here we are with a real opportunity to offer more of the services we do already for conversion, but also potentially with our large group of, uh, of uh, customers to be able to offer them platforms for sharing and pooling their data to increase uh, in a pre-competitive way how they can leverage each other's experience and also to be developing and delivering some new solutions, whether that's consultancy, uh, new products and new services for, for analytics solutions into the future. So I hope that gives you a bit, bit of a feel for um, SEND uh, and how we're taking that forward from its initial purpose of just being used for um, submissions. So now let me hand you over to uh, Gordon, who will talk you through uh, aspects of our in silico business. Thank you, Gordon. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, so in, in this part of the agenda, I'm, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to our in silico uh, technology enabled service uh, offering. We currently have uh, two main areas of business which operate under the banners knowledge scan and lead scope. And both areas take advantage of the huge pool of biomedical data you know, pr produced during discovery development and clinical practice, which has been amassed over many decades and which continues to be produced in ever-increasing volumes and ever-increasing velocities. Um, both areas exploit state-of-the-art information technology, so I'm going to use the words again, artificial intelligence, machine learning, along with data science and scientific domain expertise to distill this data and provide uh, both intelligence and insight to our clients. Knowledge Scan focuses on understanding the inherent risks of targeting biological systems to bring out some to bring about some therapeutic benefit, and it typically operates in late discovery, uh, specifically in a in a fairly new area um, called discovery toxicology. As the industry is seeking to bring some of the uh, or to, to to bring some of the issues that normally you know arrest development of their products uh, at a uh, too late a stage, they're bringing this sort of risk management a lot earlier. Um, and LeadScope focuses um, on understanding the risks, uh, in, for example, carcinogenicity risks associated with new chemical structures or potential contaminants in therapeutic interventions, for example. And LeadScope typically operates later on in early development. What's particularly exciting for us right now is that the opportunity we have together to find commercial and technical synergies to better serve our current markets, we've got that. But we also have an opportunity to extend our offerings further upstream into discovery and further downstream throughout the development uh, process and beyond. So what I want to do now is just highlight one of the in silico solutions in our portfolio, which is really exciting for a scientist like me, uh, but it's also gaining particular traction uh, with our customers. And, and by way of an introduction, I'd like to share a, a short video if we can make that happen. We know that target safety assessments, or TSAs, are critical for identifying which potential candidates to invest in. But we also know that tracking down and organizing the information you need is a laborious process, and it takes up a great deal of your time and attention. There is another way. 
let us introduce you to Knowledge Scan, the technology enabled target safety assessment service from InSTEM. Using leading edge technologies, automated workflows, and augmented intelligence techniques, Knowledge Scan searches publications, databases, and more to identify, collect, and present intelligence about potential safety issues related to your drug targets, such as unexpected side effects or toxicities. Using Knowledge Scan, InSTEM rapidly analyzes millions of available data records efficiently, systematically, and objectively so that you don't have to. This information is curated, reviewed, and interpreted by our in house scientific experts who present it to you in a comprehensive, clear, and easy to interpret report, enabling you to make quicker, better informed, evidence based decisions. A powerhouse company in the life sciences, InSTEM has set new standards in target safety assessment. We've created hundreds of TSAs for clients around the world, developing a wealth of expertise and experience in this area. Whether you choose to outsource all your TSA production to InSTEM or use us as an additional outlet to augment your in house capabilities, Knowledge Scan has become a trusted and highly efficient way for clients to undertake their TSAs. To learn more about Knowledge Scan, contact us or request a sample report today. Let InSTEM take care of the data. You take care of the science. You take care of the science. Great. I, I, I love that very last that last bit, very impactful. Um, so uh, hopefully you found that useful. Um, now, this is a slide that provides a little more context on the TSA opportunity. Um, for us, it started back in late, um, sort of late in the year in 2016, where we explored the concept of offering a technology-enabled services to one of our clients. Um, we did that. It was very successful. And we then presented, in fact, we, we did a joint presentation of our results at the Society of Toxicology meeting in the US. Now, that generated a fair bit of interest. And we uh, uh, attracted a couple of other, uh, new clients. And, and that really began a journey that has produced over 300 TSAs for 18 pharmaceutical industry customers and generated over the period 3.25 million in revenue. Now, whilst not huge returns over the period, we've seen really good growth and, and we cracked our first 1 million revenue milestone in 2019. So we've invested in process automation and AI and we've expanded the team just a little because it, it's not hugely uh, people uh, dependent. There's a lot of automation. Um, and we've launched new versions of the TSA platform. With our new version 4, we can provide an enhanced offering, particularly in terms of improved capacity and turnaround time. And it's, it's the turnaround time which is clearly uh, important to our clients. So doing that, uh, producing a high-quality uh, product uh, rapidly is, is, is critical. And, of course, you know, the more we do with automation, the more capacity we have to take on business. So as to how the business might scale moving forward, well, we've worked on around 300 targets to date, and there are actually around 24,000 targets in the human genome. Now, some of those are not tractable to drug development, but there's a large number. And if you look at that and the many different strategies for modifying the function of these targets um, and add to that the increasingly competitive information-hungry R&D process, and as Mike mentioned earlier, well over 4,000 companies in play, I, for one, think we're in the foothills of this opportunity, and uh, I really believe we've barely scratched the surface. Now, on my last slide, I just wanted to touch on a current internally funded TSA, which concerns a really interesting target called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2 for short. Now, this protein was discovered almost 20 years ago and has been the focus of quite a bit of drug development activity. Uh, it's involved in the body's defense against disease, diseases like cancer, high blood pressure, atheroma, heart failure, diabetes, for example. But it now turns out that this overwhelmingly good cop protein is unfortunately also a gateway for infection by SARS-CoV-2. So there's a paradox. ACE2 lets the virus in, but it also defends us from the damage the virus causes. Now, drugs are being developed that both attenuate and augment the functional drive of this protein. The question therefore arises, might one or both of these approaches result in serious side effects? Now there is an answer, and the answer is in the data, unsurprisingly. 
And for age two, there have been as uh, have been as many substantive articles produced in the last six months as as were produced in the previous two decades, and that's almost five thousand uh, substantial articles uh, and millions of entries in databases. So, using our platform, we have one understood the objective that is to assess the potential hazards that might be associated in the dizzying array of contexts. Uh, with downstream side effects for developing a, an inhibitor or an activator of the protein. Uh, two, we've acquired and distilled millions of data points. And three, we've compiled the position and our perspective on that position on the potential hazards in this TSA. Now, we're going to launch this TSA uh, at the American College of Toxicology in the, the, an online conference on a digital conference on Monday, the 16th of November. And we're making it available to the scientific community at no cost. Um, but we will also be using this document as a living example of what we can deliver uh, in our TSA process. And we'll be sharing it with potential clients. So I hope that's, uh, that's a rather uh, rapid whistle-stop tour of, of one of the exciting areas of the Insilico business. I've got Great hopes, got a great team and some a fantastic technology base. And, I, and as I said, I think we've we've just really started to uh, scale this. So I hope you found that interesting and useful. And on that note, I will um, hand over back to Phil, I, I believe. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, so just a a short few minutes uh, i'm conscious that we want to get to questions uh, on strategy and outlook and focused uh, very much on uh, the current state of play on uh, our m a activities having uh, undertaken that fundraise uh, that nigel mentioned in july of 15 million pounds um, our growth strategy so uh, last year we were a just under 26 million pounds in revenue. Our plan organically uh, and acquisitively is to be a 60 to 75 million pound revenue business over the next three plus years. Um, we've invested in the platform that will allow us to grow to that size and do it uh, efficiently and effectively. Um, and uh, we see that that platform is very scalable so that as we grow organically and acquisitively, we will deliver improved EBITDA margins. Acquisitions have been a key pillar for the business for many years. Uh, it was the reason we IPO'd in October 2010. We generate enough uh, profit and cash to fund our organic growth, um, being public as a way to uh, access capital to be able to use our publicly tradable uh, shares of, to accelerate our acquisition strategy. Uh, this is a very fragmented market in the areas that we focus on, which is not the whole R&D continuum. We have uh, a database of six or 700 uh, potential acquisition targets, so many, many businesses to potentially go after. Uh, lots of businesses we wouldn't acquire, but many businesses that we would. We have some very clear objectives and criteria as a consequence, it's really important that we can uh, filter those many targets uh, and what they bring to us. Uh, they might be financial things, they might be technical things. Um, most importantly, they might also be cultural things. Uh, it's really important when we come to integrate businesses uh, that we have uh, the right compatible cultures uh, to make uh, post acquisition integration successful. Uh, and of course, a key here is making sure that they deliver the right return on capital. The acquisitions that we've done post IPO, and we've done six of them, uh, are what we describe as bolt on size acquisitions. So things that are uh, typically somewhere between two and $5 million in revenue. Um, having done a number of those and having grown uh, successfully organically, uh, we are at the stage where it would make sense to not just continue to add strategically valuable bolt-on acquisitions, but to look at some of the more transformational size deals that might not only come with revenue 
synergy opportunities, but also deliver cost synergy opportunities um, and allow us to uh, offer uh, ever more compelling solutions to our clients as we cover more of the R&D uh, and post R&D uh, life sciences processes. We shared this slide uh, when we did the last uh, InvestorMeet company uh, presentation as to areas of focus. Uh, you see there in dark blue, the three areas of our business, regulatory solutions, study management, and uh, in STEM informatics or in silico solutions and where they sit in the R&D uh, continuum. Uh, and in green, the subsets of those areas where we are focusing uh, our acquisition activities. Uh, we uh, said in the Q&A session uh, of our July meeting that uh, one of these opportunities, actually one of the transformational ones, uh, was just going into exclusive due diligence. That process is continuing, uh, all things being equal. If that continues to progress successfully, we would hope that would conclude in the next two to three months. Uh, of course, uh, due diligence is a challenging process and it's, it, it, it has a, a purpose to make sure that what we're acquiring uh, is everything we want it to be. So um, those processes can fail, uh, but if it succeeds, um, that would be a great addition to the business. Um, we also said that we had um, two or three smaller uh, opportunities that we were also progressing. Uh, they have continued to progress well, uh, and it is not impossible that there are, you know, a further one or two smaller bolt-on uh, acquisition candidates that could also complete uh, over the next six months. So things are looking very positive with respect to the M&A pipeline and ensuring that those funds that we raised don't sit on the balance sheet uh, unused. So overall, uh, we're in a position where uh, the overall farmer R&D market is in a very uh, positive uh, phase of growth. Uh, that's supporting our organic growth. It's also uh, supporting the acquisition targets so that they are performing well. You know, We are looking to acquire here not struggling businesses that we can acquire cheaply. We're looking to acquire strong businesses that we can make uh, into exceptional businesses. Uh, Mike and Gordon have talked about great opportunities in SEND and in Silico Solutions for organic growth, uh, where uh, the potential is, is large. Um, we have great uh, visibility with our recurring revenues, uh, great opportunities to sell across uh, our portfolio of solutions into our large uh, and uh, very satisfied client base. So with that, uh, I am going to open up to uh, questions. Uh, we won't, won't be able to cover all of these, but as Mark said, we will answer things subsequently. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And, and thank you to Gordon, Mike, and, and obviously Nigel as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab that's situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted uh, during the event itself, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with the copy of the slides and the Q&A, published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. And finally, I'd like to say that uh, post the conclusion of this meeting, uh, you'll be given the opportunity to provide feedback uh, and, and that will be just presented to you on the close of the of the meeting. Um, um, Phil, I think we were going to put cameras on. So if I remove the slides and if I could ask everybody just to turn on to the uh, camera icon at the top um, and then turn cam on. And I think for, uh, for Gordon, if you would be so kind as to also turn your mic on, that would be great. Thank you very much indeed. I will just bring back uh, the slides just momentarily, uh, just to fill in the gap. So just on the camera icon, uh, turn cam on. Thank you very much indeed, Gordon, you're back with us. And Phil, uh, apologies if it's turning your cam um, to uh, off, but if you click on the icon at the top, it says turn cam on, it might take you back. Just make sure your picture is in the view below and then connect, that would be great. 
Obviously, investors had a, a number of uh, pre-submitted questions that were sent into us. Um, and I think, um, obviously, what I'd like to do, if it's OK with you guys, is start off the Q&A with those pre-submitted questions uh, before then moving on um, swiftly to those that have been asked during the meeting itself. Um, so, Phil, thanks ever so much. The first question that we had, and, and there, there are, I guess, a couple of things that you've touched on within the presentation and that the questions do have a, a kind of commonality. The first question that we received ahead of the event was that you've stated that you wish to make acquisitions with the money recently rain, uh, raised. Are you finding it easier or more difficult to find and afford targets since COVID-19? Um, and there were a couple of questions around how you source potential uh, acquisitions and overall how competitive they are. So perhaps you can give some, some context around that if that's possible. Sure, yes. Uh, thanks, Mark. So uh, things have got a little easier. Uh, with principles of businesses locked down at home, it's actually easier to get hold of them. Uh, and, you know, business owners are having to s deal with the challenges of COVID-19, moving their staff from their offices um, uh, to working from home. And for some people, you know, that might be the final catalyst that says, you know what, it would be nice to have somebody else help manage all of these challenges. Why don't we become part of something bigger? Um, so COVID-19 is helping us. Um, in terms of uh, valuations, um, valuations are down a little bit. Uh, some acquirers are uh, sitting on the sidelines um, because of COVID-19 and uncertainties uh, and because there's a little bit less competition for acquisition targets. Uh, prices are just a little lower, not massively so, uh, because this is a an industry that is obviously doing well. Um, and um, conversely, you do have some um, particularly private equity um, funds looking at this area, uh, and there's some extra competition. So uh, those two things are um, one positive, one less positive, but overall valuation is a little lower. In terms of sourcing deals, um, we use our own expertise and interactions in the industry, which are very broad, uh, but we also use third parties who specialize in um, identifying uh, and qualifying targets and then passing us to advance through the process. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, just to condense the next question, really, it's all around the pricing dynamics for, for each solution, kind of the historical trends, and really your ability to perhaps raise prices over time. Perhaps you give some context uh, around that, if, if, if I may. Sure. Um, so in the study management area, uh, historically, uh, you know, go back 20 years and more, it was the pharma companies that did this work internally. Um, these solutions were, in some cases, unique, uh, and we had great pricing power. Uh, the pharma companies were desperate to get their hands on them, and, and prices were high. Increasingly, over time, this work is outsourced to the contract research organizations. There are more competitors. Um, they are still really valuable and provide great return on investment to clients. So prices are still decent, but the CROs are much more cost conscious than the pharma companies. So raising prices in study management is less easy. In some of the newer areas that Gordon and Mike were talking about, send exploitation and in silico, we are back selling predominantly direct to the pharma companies again. Um, they are th Those solutions um, are not the domain, the province uh, of the CROs, uh, or at least they're not right now. Uh, the return on those um, investments they make are very high, and therefore we have much greater uh, pricing power in, in those areas. And over time, uh, Gordon and team have been able to extend uh, their pricing um, because clients are seeing the value and the uniqueness uh, in what we do. Mark, next question. Uh, yep. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I can. Perfect. I'm conscious that we're running over a little bit. We're perfectly um, happy don't to worry. carry on. 
you have a full bank of investors on the call. So if I see if Excellent. I see uh, anything there, I'll, I'll give you a he heads up. But um, I think the Q and A is probably very valuable. So I'd like to get through if we could um, these ones. So green green space opportunity versus expanded wallet share with existing customers. You know what's the opportunity in front of you uh, for each, and what kind of growth uh, from each kind of of um, kind of sector bucket should investors kind of target over the medium term? Um, so this is a really good question because we we have a broad portfolio of products and services and very few of our clients have taken you know 90 percent plus of our products and services um, a lot of clients when they first become an instant client might just take a single solution um, what we then develop is a relationship and an opportunity to expand what we offer to those clients and we manage within our sales and marketing team something called the white space um, uh, document uh, and this is a huge spreadsheet about all of our clients all of our products and services who's taken what and where is their opportunity to sell things that we haven't already sold and a huge per percentage of our market opportunity is not just brand new clients but the existing clients selling them uh, the products and service they haven't yet taken um, so a significant opportunity you know right now uh, there's probably just as much opportunity to sell to our existing clients the things they haven't taken uh, as there is to sell to brand new clients thanks very much and i think the final um question i think you you, you have touched on this but the, the question is why the need to do the larger deal uh, is it more opportunistic or is that really where the the best opportunities pre present themselves um so uh, to some degree um the small deals uh, have the advantage that i mean maybe there's a little bit less risk we're maybe putting less capital to work uh, it's something easier to get your arms around. Uh, but as many people uh, will know, uh, there's just as much work goes into finding and going through the due diligence process and integrating a small acquisition as there is a larger acquisition. So if you want to add um, you know, £10 million worth of revenue or £20 million worth of revenue, it'll cost you four times as much and take four times as much effort if you did uh, that as four or £5 million pounds revenue businesses as one 20 million pound revenue business and it's generally the case that the smaller businesses we acquire are pretty lean in their cost structures often we need to add cost to be able to realize the revenue synergy opportunities whereas when we start to look at bigger businesses there's more opportunity to be able to identify cost synergies as well as revenue synergies so it might be that we need to pay a little bit more in multiple terms, um, but it does mean that we can make bigger strides forward. And with the talent and the bandwidth that exists when you bring two bigger businesses together, the opportunities to then advance some really compelling joint new products and services that can add significant value to our clients can be much greater than the opportunities when you add something small. Um, so small things remain still really, really helpful to us, uh, but some of the bigger acquisition targets provide some huge opportunities for our clients and as a consequence uh, for the other in-stem stakeholders. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Phil, for addressing those. Obviously, if I could just now uh, ask you, obviously you've had a, uh, you know, a handful of questions that have come through. Um, if you scroll down towards, um, uh, the first one being what limits and if i could ask you perhaps to read out the questions because investors can't see a, another investor's question and and perhaps give uh, responses where that's appropriate and then once we've completed those um i will ask you to wrap up and read other investors for feedback so back to you phil if i may sure so um abby R, thank you very much i'm going to focus this towards nigel uh, what visibility do you have on your recurring revenue and what are your typical contract lengths? So typical contract lengths in terms of recurring businesses is, is, is annual. So it's, a, it's an annual support and maintenance arrangement, annual SaaS subscriptions. Um, as Phil was saying before, we have very high retention rates. 
um, very close to 100%. So actually, when I talked before about 60% of recurring revenues, that's typically what we would start the year with as our expectation. Uh, in addition to what we would classify as backlog uh, orders or, or forward a forward order book as well at the beginning of the year, which could be another few percent, uh, which is orders placed for new business at the end of one year, one calendar year, which will roll over into the beginning of the new year. So typically we could have between 60 and 65 percent of, uh, of our revenues uh, on the face of it covered for the uh, for the year ahead. And, uh, and that's typically typically the, uh, we have annual uh, arrangements, one or two larger clients. We may have something a little bit longer, but typically it's annually. OK, thank you. Thanks, Nigel. And then there's a couple of questions that are related to SEND uh, and SEND work being done by CROs, uh, which I'm going to target at Mike. So this is Mike's our SEND expert. So you've mentioned that some CROs are taking SEND conversion in-house. Do you think the increased revenues for SEND exploitation will outweigh this in the short and long term? And there's a second question I see that says, are the CROs now doing SEND work? So perhaps if I start there, okay. um, so one or two of the CROs have always done their own SEND work. So uh, they, they just had such a large volume of studies for them, it made sense to do that in the first place. Um, as we've seen, as and I mentioned, uh, the SEND standards gradually increasing in its coverage. So yes, one or two of the what you might call medium-sized CROs are, have decided that it's time to have a go themselves at doing SEND. Um, we, we kind of win both ways there, though, because those those CROs are buying our software in order to be able to do that work themselves. And actually, they're buying our software and asking us to help them to implement it and to provide some of our um, send knowledge and conversion skills to help them get up to speed. So that's not a sort of clean break move from running all the business to nothing. There's a there's a there's quite a transition. And at the end of it, we should have a good recurring revenue stream from our software as a result of that. In terms of will send exploitation outweigh it? I suppose the, the other thing is to go back to what I mentioned about more complex study designs coming along. Some of these CROs, even the ones who are doing stuff in-house, don't want to do the complicated send uh, in the future. They want to leave that to us. They know we're experts at it. They don't want to get involved in it. It's too hard. Um, so that, that's going to give us some more conversion work, not less. Um, but exploitation, I think if I had to say, will it outweigh it? I would say medium to long term. I could see that being a really great opportunity for us short term. Probably not. We've got to get it grown. Um, but I would say definitely there's a really good opportunity there. Don't imagine it's all of those 4,000 companies. It's probably half of them or slightly less because many of them don't have enough compounds and enough history to do that mining. But there's definitely a decent size market of people out there who are going to want exploitation solutions over the coming years. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Mike. I, Phil, I think I'm just scrolling down the same thing, and I'm also mindful of time. Um, bearing in mind we're, we're, we're a quarter of an hour through the, the close of the meeting. Um, I, I think you've probably touched on most of the questions, of course, just for any investor that submitted them. Anything that we've missed, well, obviously, we'll, we'll be pr presenting to the company post the meeting anyway. So perhaps, Phil, it, would it be okay with you if I just ask you to perhaps wrap up? And, and I know investor feedback is important, and I will direct the company to give you the, the, their best shout at that. Yep, yeah, Mark, thank you very much uh, to everyone on the call. Thank you very much uh, to Nigel, uh, Mike and Gordon. Uh, also, thank you very much. Uh, as Mark said, your feedback is really important to us. These opportunities are important to us. Uh, we see the, the retail uh, investor, the private investor as being uh, really important uh, as part of uh, the broader um, investment mix. Uh, and we will continue uh, to offer uh, these uh, types of presentations uh, through uh, Investor Meets Company and through uh, other channels. Uh, and we look forward to speaking to you again, hopefully in the not too distant future, when we might well be sharing uh, some exciting news f with you if we can get uh, the first of one of these acquisitions completed uh, and we can talk about what that will bring to the business. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and well. Um, I'm sorry to hear you're all going down into lockdown again, 
Uh, I'm sure we're probably only a few weeks behind you in the US. So stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. opportunity to provide feedback. If you access this meeting via our website, the uh, um, feedback form will appear. But if you access it via the link by sent to you by email, you'll be asked to log in. It will take a, a, a 30 seconds or so. But uh, I think as Phil said, you know, feedback is incredibly important to the company. Um, with that said, and on behalf of the total team at uh, Instem PLC, we'd like to thank you very much for attending today's presentation. That now concludes the session.